Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the Criminal Procedure Code and in this lecture we will have a look at some other provisions of the CRPC especially as they relate to what is done in the courts once the complaint is filed. So chapter 15 deals with complaints to the magistrates. Section 200 here says examination of the complaint. A magistrate taking cognizance of an offence on complaint shall examine upon oath the complainant and the witnesses present, if any, and the substance of such examination shall be reduced to writing and signed by the complainant and the witnesses and also by the magistrate. So what's the first thing that happens? Once the magistrate has taken cognizance of an offence based on a complaint, then he shall examine upon oath. So the person would have to say that I am giving these statements on oath that they are correct. Who will give the statements? Who will be examined? The complainant and the witnesses that are present, if any. And the substance of this examination shall be reduced to writing. So it will be written down. It will be signed by the complainant, the witnesses and also by the magistrate. But then this is not always necessary. Provided that when the complaint is made in writing, the magistrate need not examine the complainant and the witnesses. Only when the complaint is made in writing. If a public servant acting or purporting to act in the discharge of his official duties or a court has made the complaint. Now basically when we talk about the conservation laws like the Indian Forest Act or the Wildlife Protection Act, we put in the cases for trial on this section. So we put a complaint case before the court and in this case the complaint is made in writing. And it is made by the public servant, that is an official of the forest department. So in this case, the examination of the complainant and the witnesses is not required. Or B, if the magistrate takes over the case for inquiry or trial to another magistrate under section 192. So in that case also the examination is not needed. Provided further that if the magistrate makes over the case to another magistrate under section 192, after examining the complainant and the witnesses, the latter magistrate need not re-examine them. That is, the magistrate who is sending the case to another magistrate, he, the first magistrate need not do the examination because the second one would do it. But if the first one has already done the examination, then the second magistrate need not re-examine the complainant and the witnesses. So that's the first thing that happens. The magistrate examines the complainant and the witnesses. Then procedure by magistrate not competent to take cognizance of the case. If the complaint is made to a magistrate who is not competent to take cognizance of the offence, he shall, if the complaint is in writing, return it for presentation to the proper court with an endorsement to that effect. So if the co complaint is in writing and the magistrate is not competent. So in that case, he will return it for presentation to the proper court with an endorsement to that effect. So he will write it down that it should be presented to the other court. And if the complaint is not in writing, then he will direct the complainant to the proper court, the one that has the jurisdiction in this case. Then postponement of issue of process, any magistrate on receipt of a complaint of an offence of which he is authorized to take cognizance or which has been made over to him under section 192. So it is talking about a magistrate who has received a complaint and he is authorized to take cognizance. So he is the competent authority or it has been made over to him under section 192. So it has been sent to him. May if he thinks fit and shall in a case where the accused is residing at a place beyond the area 
in which he exercises his jurisdiction. So, may if he thinks fit and shall, that is and has to in case where the accused is residing a place beyond the area where he exercises his jurisdiction, postpone the issue of process against the accused and either inquire into the case himself or direct an investigation to be made by a police officer or by such other person as he thinks fit for the purpose of deciding whether or not there is sufficient ground for proceeding. That is, once the complaint has been received, then the magistrate next has to consider whether there is sufficient ground for proceeding or not. And in those cases where the accused resides at some other place beyond the jurisdiction of the magistrate, he has to move it through this process. It has to be examined whether there is a sufficient ground for proceeding or not. Otherwise, it becomes a wastage of time, money and effort to call that accused. And so, it has to be checked first whether there is sufficient ground for proceeding or not. And how will this checking be done? It will be done either through an inquiry or through an investigation. Provided that no such direction for investigation shall be made, where it appears to the magistrate that the offence complained of is triable exclusively by the court of session. So, if, if it is triable exclusively by the court of session, then this direction for investigation will not be made. Or where the complaint has not been made by a court, unless the complainant and the witnesses present, if any, have been examined on oath under section 200. So, in these cases, the uh, investigation is not needed. In an inquiry under subsection 1, the magistrate may, if he thinks fit, take evidence of witnesses on oath. So, if he is doing the inquiry himself, then he may take evidence of the witnesses on oath. Provided that if it appears to the magistrate that an offence complained of is tribal exclusively by the court of session, he shall call upon the complainant to produce all his witnesses and examine them on oath. If an investigation under subsection 1 is made by a person not being a police officer, he shall have for that investigation all the powers conferred by this court on an officer in charge of a police station except the power to arrest without warrant. So, if the investigation is done by someone else, so here we saw that investigation to be made by a police officer or by such other person as the magistrate thinks fit. So, if it is given to some other person, then that some other person will have all the powers of the CRPC that are given to an officer in charge of a police station except the power to arrest without warrant. So, apart from this power, all the powers are there so that he can do the investigation properly. Next, there is the uh, section for dismissal of complaint. If after considering the statements on oath, if any, of the complainant or, and of the witnesses and the result of the inquiry or investigation, if any, under section 202, the magistrate is of the opinion that there is no sufficient ground for proceeding. He shall dismiss the complaint and in every such case, he shall briefly record his reasons for so doing. So, if it turns out that there are no grounds for proceeding, there is no sufficient ground for proceeding, in that case, the magistrate shall dismiss the complaint. That is, he has to dismiss the complaint, no further proceeding lies. And in every such case, he shall briefly record the reasons for doing so, why he, he considers that there is no sufficient ground for proceeding. Then if the case is not dismissed, then we move to chapter 16, commencement of proceedings before the magistrates. So, what happens next? Section 204 says issue of process. If in the opinion of a magistrate taking cognizance of an offence that there is sufficient ground for proceeding. If there were no sufficient ground, then it would have been dismissed. But this case has not been dismissed and the case appears to be a summons case he shall issue his summons for the attendance of the accused. So, in the case of summons case, there will be a summons issued. If it is a warrant case, then he may issue a warrant or if he thinks fit, a summons. So, a warrant case does not mean that a warrant has to be issued. A summons may be issued even for a warrant case. For causing the accused to be brought or to appear at certain time before such magistrate or if he has no jurisdiction himself, some other magistrate having jurisdiction. Now, no summons or warrant shall be issued against the accused under subsection 1 
until a list of the prosecution witnesses has been filed. So before uh, issuing a summons or a warrant, there has to be a list of prosecution witnesses has to be filed. Only then will these proceedings move further. Then in a proceeding instituted upon the complaint made in writing, every summons or warrant issued under subsection 1 shall be accompanied by a copy of such complaint. So when you are asking somebody to come to the court, he should know why he has to come. And so a copy of the complaint is always attached to the summons and warrant. When by any law for the time being in force, any process fee or other fee are payable, no process shall be issued until the fee are paid. And if such fee are not paid within a reasonable time, the magistrate may dismiss the complaint. So even at this stage, the complaint can be dismissed if the court fees or other fees are not paid. And nothing in this section shall be deemed to affect the provisions of section 87. Then section 205 says magistrate may dispense with personal attendance of the accused. So in the last section we saw that there is a summons or a warrant that is issued for calling that person. But in section 205 the magistrate may dispense with the personal attendance of the accused. It is not always necessary that the accused should be present himself. So whenever a magistrate issues a summons he may if he sees reason to do so dispense with the personal attendance of the accused and permit him to appear by his pleader. So there can be an advocate who is representing him. He does not have to come himself. But the magistrate inquiring into or trying the case may in his discretion at any stage of the proceedings direct the personal attendance of the accused and if necessary enforce such attendance in the manner herein before provided. So the Magistrate may decide that it is not necessary to call the person himself, but he may also ask for the personal attendance of the accused. So this is the power of the magistrate. Then special summons in the case of petty offence. So if it is a small offence that can be summarily disposed of, then there is a special summons for that. If in the opinion of a magistrate taking cognizance of a petty offence, the case may be summarily disposed of under section 260 or section 261, the magistrate shall, that is has to, except where he is for reasons to be recorded in writing of a contrary opinion, issue summons to the accused requiring him either to appear in person or by pleader before the magistrate on a specified date. Or if he desires to plead guilty to the charge without appearing before the magistrate, to transmit before the specified date by post or by messenger to the magistrate the said plea in writing and the amount of fine specified in the summons or if he desires to appear by pleader and to plead guilty to the charge through such pleader to authorize in writing the pleader to plead guilty of the charge on his behalf and to pay the fine through such pleader. So this is a special summons for very small offenses that can be summarily disposed of. So in these cases the special summons is sent and the person may plead guilty either through a letter or through the pleader or by coming himself. Then 207 says supply to the accused of copy of police report and other documents. In any case where the proceeding has been instituted on a police report, the magistrate shall without delay furnish to the accused free of cost a copy of each of the following. So the accused if you are calling him to the court he should know what the case is all about and he should be in a position to prepare his own case and for that he needs to know what is the complaint all about and so he has to be supplied free of cost a copy of the police report, the FIR, the statements recorded under subsection 3 of section 161, the confessions and statements if recorded under section 164 and any other document or relevant extract thereof forwarded to the magistrate with the police report. So basically, if the accused has to prepare his case, he requires documents and in this case, the CRPC is saying that the magistrate has to supply all of these documents free of charge so that he is able to make his case. But then it also says provided that if the magistrate is satisfied that any document referred to in clause 5, that is any other document, is voluminous, is very large in size, 
he shall instead of furnishing the accused with a copy thereof direct that he will only be allowed to inspect it either personally or through pleader in the court so if if it is a very thick document very voluminous document then it may be given access to only in the court so that is another option then 208 says supply of copies of statements and documents to accused in other cases triable by court of session where in a case instituted otherwise than on a police report it appears to the magistrate issuing process under section 204 that the offence is tri triable exclusively by the court of session the magistrate shall without delay furnish to the accused free of copy all of these documents so basically what this is saying is if there is a case otherwise instituted than on a police report then the magistrate will send it to uh, and uh, it turns out that it is triable exclusively by the court of session now in this case the magistrate will send this case to the court of session but at the same time he will without delay furnish all the documents so that the accused can start preparing his case right away then section 209 says commitment of case to the court of session when offence is triable exclusively by it when in a case instituted on a police report or otherwise the accused appears or is brought before the magistrate and it appears to the magistrate that the offence is triable exclusively by the court of session he shall commit after complying with the provisions of section 207 or 208 as the case may be the case to the court of session and subject to the provisions of this code relating to bail remand the accused to custody until such commitment has been made and subject to the provisions of this code relating to bail remand the accused to custody during and until the conclusion of the trial then send to that court the uh, record of the case and the documents and articles if any which are to be produced in evidence and notify the public prosecutor of the commitment of the case to the court of session that is what it is saying is if there is a case that is triable exclusively by the court of session then the court to which this case has appeared it is going to do n number of things it's going to send this case to the court of session it has to commit it to the court of session then it has to notify the public prosecutor that it has been committed so then it has to provide all the documents to the accused and then it has to uh, put the accused in either a remand or on a bail as the cases may be then section 210 says procedure to be followed when there is a complaint case and police investigation in respect of the same offence so if there is a case where there is a complaint under section 200 but there is also a police investigation in the same offence so both the things are going on then what to do when in a case instituted otherwise than on a police report here in referred to as a complaint case it is made to appear to the magistrate during the course of the inquiry or trial held by him that an investigation by the police is in progress in relation to offence which is the subject matter of inquiry of or trial held by him the magistrate shall stay the proceedings of such inquiry or trial and call for a report on the matter from the police officer conducting the investigation so if both the things are going on then the proceedings in the complaint case will be stayed and they have to be stayed the magistrate shall stay the proceedings and then he will call a report on the matter from the police officer that is conducting the investigation if a report is made by the investigating police officer under section 173 and on such report cognizance of any offence is taken by the magistrate against any person who is an accused in the complaint case the magistrate shall inquire into or try together the complaint case and the case arising out of the police report as if both the cases were instituted on a police report so in these cases both the cases will be tried together as being of on a police report and if the police report does not relate to any accused in the complaint case or if the magistrate does not take cognizance of any offence on the police report he shall proceed with the inquiry or trial which was stayed by him in accordance with the provisions of this code so if it turns out that the police investigation is also uh, making the same accused uh, an offender and the magistrate is taking a cognizance then the whole of the uh, of the proceeding will move as on a police report but if if it turns out that the police report does not have anything to do with the 
accused in the complaint case. Or even if it has to do something with the accused, the magistrate does not take cognizance of any offence in the police report, then the magistrate will proceed with the complaint case as it is. Then chapter 17 deals with charge. So, form of charges, it says contents of the charge. So, we always say or we always hear about charge sheets being served, charge sheets being filed and so on. So, what is this charge sheet? What is a charge? So, a charge sheet is a sheet that contains the charges. And what is a charge? A charge is uh, defined by uh, section 211. Contents of charge, every charge under this code shall state the offence with which the accused is charged. So, what is there in the charge? The charge states the offence. What have you done wrong with which the accused is charged? If the law which creates the offence gives it a, any specific name, the offence may be described in the charge by that name only. So, it has to be very specific according to what is written in the law. If the law which creates the offence does not give it any specific name, so much of the definition of the offence must be stated as to give the accused notice of the matter with which he is charged. So, basically the charge is telling the accused about what is the offence with which he is charged. And if there is a specific name, then the charge will mention that specific name. If there is no specific name, then it will write the definition of the offence so that the accused is able to understand what is he being charged with. The law and the section of law against which the offence is said to have been committed shall be mentioned in the charge. So, what is the law and what is the section? That also has to be mentioned in the charge. The fact that the charge is made is equivalent to a statement that every legal condition required by law to constitute an offence charge was fulfilled in the particular case. And this is where the investigation and inquiry come into picture. If you have written a charge, it means that all the legal conditions required by law to constitute the offence charge have been fulfilled. So, you cannot first make a charge and then say that okay, these conditions were not fulfilled. No. All the conditions once they have been fulfilled and this is checked in the investigation and inquiry. So, if they have been fulfilled, then only it will be there in this charge. The charge shall be written in the language of the court. And if the accused having been uh, previously convicted of any offence is liable by reasons of such previous conviction to enhanced punishment or to punishment of a different kind for a subsequent offence and it is intended to prove such previous conviction for the purpose of affecting the punishment which the court may think fit to award for the subsequent offence, the fact, date and place of the previous conviction shall be stated in the charge. And if such a statement has been omitted, the court may add it at any time before the sentence is passed. So, this is also an important condition. So, for example, A is charged with the murder of B. This is equivalent to a statement that A's act fell within the definition of murder given in the sections of the IPC. It did not fall within any of the general exceptions of the set court and it did not fall, fall within any of the five exceptions to section 300 or if it did fall within exception 1, one or the other provisio to that exception applied to it. So, if the charge is that A is charged with the murder of B, it means that A is action falls within the definition and it does not come under any of the exceptions or any of the other loopholes. A is charged under section 326 of the penal uh, of the IPC with voluntarily causing grievous hurt to B by means of an instrument for shooting. Now, this is equivalent to a statement that the case was not provided for by section 335 of the said code and that the general exceptions did not apply to it. So, all the legal conditions must have been met. So, this is what section 211 is saying. Then 212 says particulars as to time, place and person. The charge shall contain such particulars as to the time and place of the alleged offence, the person if any against whom or the thing if any in respect of which it was committed as are reasonably sufficient to give a, the accused notice of the matter with which he is charged. 
so if a charge is being given then the accused should know, should know everything about what he is being charged with when did the offense take place where did the offense take place against which person or which thing was the offense committed and so on when the accused is charged with criminal breach of trust or dishonest misappropriation of money or other movable property it shall be sufficient to specify the gross sum or as the case may be describe the movable property in respect of which the offense is alleged to have been committed and the dates between which the offense is alleged to have been committed without specifying particular items or exact dates and the charge so, so framed shall be deemed to be a charge of an offense within the meaning of section 219 so in certain cases some amount of leeway is there provided that the time included between the first and the last of such dates shall not exceed one year so basically the charge has to tell the accused or inform the accused or give notice to the accused about the law the section the offense when did the offense happen where did it happen uh, uh, towards which person or thing did the offense happen and so on so it has to specify everything then section 213 says when manner of committing offense may be stated must be stated when the nature of the case is such that the particulars mentioned in sections 212 and 200 and uh, 211 and 212 do not give the accused sufficient notice of the matter with which he is charged the charge shall also contain such particulars of the matter in which the alleged offense was committed as will be sufficient for that purpose so if the particulars are not sufficient then other particulars should also be given for example a is accused of the theft of a certain article at a certain time and place the charge need not set out the manner in which the theft was affected why because if you say that this person has stolen a tv at a time say 9 pm on this particular date and at this place so this is sufficient to inform the accused about what he is being charged with but if a is accused of cheating b at a given time and place so in that case this is not sufficient because how did he cheat cheating just saying cheating is not enough so the charge must set out the manner in which a cheated b in the first illustration just mentioning that a tv was stolen on this date this time and this place is sufficient to tell the accused about what he is being charged with but in illustration b if you just say that you have cheated another person that is not sufficient so it must set out a, uh, the manner in which you have cheated how did you cheat the other person so basically you have to be very specific about giving information to the accused then section 214 says words in charge taken in sense of law under which the offense is punishable in every charge words used in describing an offense shall be deemed to have been used in the sense attached to them respectively by the law under which such offense is punishable because you have already mentioned the law you have already mentioned the section and so the words are deemed to be used in uh, respect of those uh, laws and sections then section 215 says effect of errors no error in stating either the offense or the particulars required to be stated in the charge and no omission to state the offense or those particulars shall be regarded at any stage of the case as material unless the accused was in fact misled by such error or omission and it has occasioned a failure of justice so basically while the charge is supposed to be very specific it is supposed to give all information to the accused but then to if there are some mistakes there is something that is wrongly written or there is something that was missed out so this is not going to be a material mistake in the case that is the case will not be thrown off just because the charge was not written correctly provided that it should not have misled the offender or the accused in which cases certain other precautions have to be brought in so for example a is charged with section uh, under section 242 of the ipc with having been in possession of counterfeit coin 
having known at that time when he became possessed thereof that such coin was fraud was counterfeit now this is the charge and if you look at section 242 of the ipc it says it has the word fraudulently now when the charge was being written the word fraudulently got missed out now unless it appears that a was in fact missed by this omission this error shall not be regarded as a material error so the court is going to overlook the fact that this was a small mistake now a is charged with the murder of khuda baksh on 21st of january he in fact uh, uh, but in fact the murdered person's name was not khuda baksh it was heather baksh and the date of the murder was not 21st january it was 20th january and he was never charged with any murder but this murder and had heard the inquiry before the magistrate which referred exclusively to the case of heather baksh now the court may infer from these facts that a was not misled and that the error in the charge was immaterial so in the charge that was written in place of heather baksh khuda baksh was written in place of 20 january 21st january was written but then to when the inquiry was going on before the magistrate it exclusively referred to the case of heather baksh which is the correct name so in this case the court will infer that a was not misled so a knew what he was being charged about and so the error in the charge is immaterial however if a is charged with murdering heather baksh on 20th january and khuda baksh on 21st january so a has a has been given two charges one is murdering heather baksh and the second is murdering khuda baksh when charged for the murder of heather baksh he was tried for the murder of khuda baksh and the witnesses present in his defense were witnesses in the case of heather baksh so what happened was he was charged for the murder of heather baksh so he brought all the witnesses for this particular case of heather baksh but the trial that went on was for the murder of khuda baksh so in this case it the court may infer that he was misled he was not given the correct information and this error was material so the court will rule that the charge was not properly framed but then even if the charge is not properly framed that's not the end of the world why because 2216 gives the court the power to alter the charge any court may alter or add to any charge at any time before the judgment is pronounced so if there are mistakes they can be corrected if there are things that are left out they can be added at any time before the final judgment is pronounced now every such alteration or addition shall be read and explained to the accused so if any changes in the um, charges are being made then they have to be read and explained to the accused so that he understands that the the charges have been changed if the alteration or addition to a charge is such that pre proceeding immediately with the trial is not likely in the opinion of the court to prejudice the accused in his defense or the prosecutor in the conduct of the case the court may in its discretion after such alteration or addition has been made proceed with the trial as if the altered or uh, added charge has had been the original charge so basically if the court thinks that this change is not likely to prejudice either the accused or the prosecutor that is if the court thinks that neither of the parties is going to be very much harmed or they will be in a uh, they will be be put in a position where they will not have uh, sufficient time or resources to move ahead if the court thinks that that is not the situation then the court will proceed with the trial as if the altered or added charge had been the original charge and if the alteration or addition is such that proceeding immediately with the trial is likely in the opinion of the court to prejudice the accused or the prosecutor as aforesaid the court may either direct a new trial or adjourn the trial for such period as may be necessary so if the court thinks 
that because these changes have been made, the prosecution or the defense would need more time. Then the court may adjourn the trial for such period as may be necessary. So, it will give this time to the prosecution and the defense or the court may also direct that a new trial should be done. If the offense stated in the altered or added charge is one for the prosecution of which previous sanction is necessary, the case shall not be proceeded with until such sanction is obtained unless sanction has already been obtained for a prosecution on the same facts as those on which the altered or added charge is founded. So, if the added charge or the altered charge requires a previous sanction, then before the sanction is taken is received, the case shall not be proceeded unless the sanction has already been obtained for a prosecution on the same facts as those on which the altered or added charge is founded. Then 217 says recall of witnesses when charge altered. So, if you had an earlier charge and there were witnesses that were called because of that charge and then the charge got altered. So, if the charge got altered, then the witnesses may be called again. So, this is recalling of the witnesses, you, have, you are calling them again. Whenever a charge is altered or added to by the court, after the commencement of the trial, the prosecutor and the accused shall be allowed to recall or resummon and examine with reference to such alteration or addition any witness who may have been examined unless the court for reasons to be recorded in writing considers that the prosecutor or the accused as the case may be desires to recall or re-examine such witness for the purpose of vexation or delay or for defeating the ends of justice. So, because changes have been made, so there is an option of recalling and resummoning the witnesses by both the prosecution and the defense. Unless in cases where the court for reasons to be recorded in writing considers that the prosecutor or the accused as the case may be is trying to recall and re-examine such witnesses only for the purposes of vexation that is only for troubling the witnesses or irritating the witnesses or delaying the case or for defeating the ends of justice. So, in those cases the court may say that no you are not allowed to recall, re-summon or re-examine these witnesses and they are also allowed to call any further witness with whom the court may think to be material. So, if the, ch uh, the charges have been changed. They or there has been some addition, then the witnesses may be called again for a re-examination or new witnesses may be called, except in those cases where the court has a considered opinion that the parties are only doing it for defeating the ends of justice. Otherwise, this is a power with the, uh, uh, with, the uh, with both the parties. Then B deals with joinder of charges. How do you join the charges? So, in this context, 218 says separate charges for distinct offenses. For every distinct offense of which any person is accused, there shall be a separate charge, and every such charge shall be tried separately. So, if a person is accused of having done several offenses, so for every distinct offense, every separate offense, there shall be a separate charge and every such charge shall be tried separately. Provided that where the accused person by an application in writing so desires and the magistrate is of opinion that such person is not likely to be prejudiced thereby, the magistrate may try together all or any number of charges framed against such person. So, the cases may be tried together only when the accused person is asking for it, not the prosecuting person. Now, nothing in subsection 1 shall affect the operation of the provisions of sections 219, 220, 221 and 223. Example, A is accused of a theft on one occasion 
एंड ऑफ कॉजिंग ग्रीवस हर्ट ऑन अनदर अकेजन सो ए मस्ट बी चार्ज सेपरेटली एंड ट्राइड सेपरेटली फॉर द थेफ्ट एंड फॉर कॉजिंग ग्रीवस हर्ट बिकॉज बोथ ऑफ दीज आर डिस्टिंग ऑफेंसेस एंड सो देर मस्ट बी अ सेपरेट चार्ज एंड अ सेपरेट ट्रायल फॉर बोथ ऑफ दीज now three offenses of the same kind so basically if they are not distinct if they are of the same kind within a year may be charged together when a person is accused of more offenses than one of the same kind committed within the space of 12 months from the first to the last of such offenses whether in respect of the same person or not he may be charged with and tried at one trial for any number of them not exceeding 3 and offenses are of the same kind when they are punishable with the same amount of punishment under the same section of the ipc or any special or local law so it has to be the same section the same law and punishable with the same amount of punishment so in those cases if three offenses have occurred within a year then those three offenses can be tried together then where it is doubtful what offense has been committed if a single act or a series of acts is of such nature that it is doubtful which of the several offenses the facts which can be proved will constitute the accused may be charged with having committed all or any of such offenses and any number of such charges may be tried at once or he may be charged in the alternative with having committed some one of the said offenses now if there is a single act or if there is a series of acts which are of such a nature that it is doubtful which of the several offenses the facts which can be proved will constitute so it is a doubt that which offense has been committed so in those cases the accused may be charged with having committed all of the offenses or any of the offenses and any number of such charges may be tried at once now if in such a case the accused is charged with one offense and it appears in evidence that he committed a different offense for which he might have been charged under the provisions of subsection 1 he may be convicted of the offense which is which uh, he is shown to have committed even though he was not charged with it now whether you are writing that he has committed all the offenses or any of those offenses and if it turns out that there was another offense which he had committed for which he might have been charged under the provisions of subsection 1 then he may be convicted of that particular offense so there is no restriction that you have to write everything then and there and even if there are some changes then there is some leniency here not for the accused but for the prosecutor for example a states on oath before the magistrate that he saw b hit c with a club so before the magistrate a is saying that b has hit c but when the case goes to the sessions court a states on oath that b has never hit c now in these cases it is not known whether b has hit c or not but it is completely known that a has stated on oath a false thing either before the magistrate court or before the sessions court it is not clear whether a has lied in the magistrate's court or in the sessions court but from these statements at least this is certain that a has lied on oath before one of these courts now in this case a may be charged in the alternative and convicted of intentionally giving false evidence so a can be charged here although it cannot be proved which of these contradictory statements was false so this is what this section is saying then section 224 says withdrawal of remaining charges on conviction of one of several charges when a charge containing more heads than one is framed against the same person and when a conviction has been had on one or more of them the complainant or the officer conducting the prosecution may with the consent of the court now here the consent of the court is important withdraw the remaining charge or charges or the court of its own accord may stay the inquiry into or trial of such charge or charges 
and such withdrawal shall have the effect of acquittal on such charge or charges unless the conviction be set, uh, set aside in which case the said court subject to the order of the court setting aside the conviction may proceed with inquiry into or trial of the charge or charges so withdrawn. So basically this section is saying that suppose a person was accused of having committed 10 offenses. So there were 10 charges and out of those 10 charges in 3 charges this person has already been convicted. So in that case the prosecution may say or the court may say that for the rest of the 7 charges let us drop these and dropping of these charges has the same effect as that of acquittal that is it is having the, the same effect as if the person has not committed those offenses. So this dropping of charges is also permitted with the caveat that if another court sets aside the conviction of the three charges of which he was uh, actually uh, convicted then inquiry in the rest of the seven charges may proceed. So in this case if the person has already been convicted seven charges were dropped and the inquiry was stopped but if those three charges their conviction has been set aside then the inquiry in or the investigation into the rest of the seven charges will then resume. This is what the section is saying. Then chapter 18 deals with trial before a court of session. So what happens in a sessions court? So trial to be conducted by a public prosecutor. In every trial before the court of session, the prosecution shall be conducted by a public prosecutor, which is a government prosecutor. Opening case for prosecution, when the accused appears or is brought before the court in pursuance of a commitment of the case under section 209, the prosecutor shall open his case by describing the charge brought against the accused and stating by what evidence he proposes to prove the guilt of the accused. So this is known as opening the case for prosecution. The PP will say what are the charges and what is the evidence through which he is going to prove the guilt of the accused. Then section 227 talks about discharge. If upon consideration of the record of the case and the document submitted therewith and after hearing the submissions of the accused and the prosecution in this behalf, the judge considers that there is not sufficient ground for proceeding against the accused. He shall discharge the accused and record his reasons for so doing. So he can discharge at this stage. Then there is framing of charge. If after such consideration and hearing as aforesaid, the judge is of the opinion that there is a ground for presuming that the accused has committed an offence, which is not exclusively triable by the court of session, he may frame a charge against the accused and by order transfer the case for trial to the CJM or any other judicial magistrate of the first class and direct the accused to appear before the CJM or as the case may be the judicial magistrate of the first class on such date as he deems fit and thereupon such magistrate shall try the offence in accordance with the procedure for the trial of warrant cases instituted on a police report. So if the sessions court finds out that this offence is not exclusively triable by the court of session, then the sessions court will frame the charge against the accused and then transfer this case to the lower court or if it is exclusively triable by the court he shall frame in writing a charge against the accused and where the judge frames any charge under clause b of subsection 1 the charge shall be read and explained to the accused and the accused shall be asked whether he pleads guilty of the offense charged or claims to be tried so once the charges are framed then the accused is asked whether he wants to plead guilty or he wants to be tried for this offence. If he pleads guilty, then there is conviction on the plea of guilty. If the accused pleads guilty, the judge shall record the plea and may in his discretion convict him thereon. So that is the end of the case. And if the accused refuses to plead or does not plead or claims to be tried or is not convicted under section 229 
the judge shall fix a date for the examination of witnesses and may on the application of the prosecution issue any process for compelling the attendance of any witness or the production of any document or other thing. So if the accused has not pleaded guilty, so in that case the trial will start and a date will be given. Then evidence for prosecution, on the date so fixed, the judge shall proceed to take all such evidence as may be produced in support of the prosecution. The judge may in his discretion permit the cross-examination of any witness to be deferred until any other witness or witnesses have been examined or recall any witness for further cross-examination. So we have seen this before. Acquittal, if after taking the evidence for the prosecution, examining the accused and hearing the prosecution and the defense on the point, the judge considers that there is no evidence that the accused committed the offense. Then the judge shall record an order of acquittal. So in this case, the person has been left free. So he has been acquitted of those charges. Then entering upon defense, where the accused is not acquitted under section 232, he shall be called upon to enter on his defense and adduce any evidence he may have in support thereof. So once the prosecution side is done and the person is not acquitted, then you have the entering upon of defense. So the, when the accused is not acquitted, he shall be called upon to enter on his defense and adduce any evidence that he may have in support thereof. So now the defense comes in. If the accused puts in any written statement, the judge shall file it with the record. And if the accused applies for the issue of any process for compelling the attendance of any witness or the production of any document or thing, the judge shall issue such process unless he considers for reasons to be recorded that such application should be reduced or should be refused on the ground that it is made for the purpose of vexation or delay or for defeating the ends of justice. So now after the prosecution has presented its case, now is the time of the defense. Now in the time of the defense, the evidence may be given, a written statement can be given which the judge will file on the record and if the accused applies for the issue of any process for the attendance of witness or the production of document or thing, then these processes will begin. So he may also call uh, witnesses or documents and things except on cases when the uh, court thinks that it is being just being done for the purpose of vexation or troubling others or for delaying or for defeating the ends of justice. Then there are arguments. When the examination of the witnesses, if any, for the defense is complete, the prosecutor shall sum up his case and the accused or his pleader shall be entitled to reply. So after all of this has been done, now is the time for the arguments. So when the examination of the witnesses for the defense is complete, then prosecutor again gets the chance. He sums up the case and the accused or his pleader is entitled to reply. Provided that where any point of law is raised by the accused or his pleader, the prosecution may, with the permission of the judge, make his submissions with regard to such point of law. Then judgment of acquittal or conviction. After the arguments also are done, after hearing the arguments and the points of law, if any, the judge shall give a judgment in the case. If the accused is convicted, the judge shall, unless he proceeds in accordance with the provisions of section 360, hear the accused on the questions of sentence and then pass sentence on him according to law. So this is how a conviction is done. Then previous conviction, in a case where a previous conviction is charged under the provisions of subsection 7 of section 211 and the accused does not admit that he has been previously convicted as alleged in the charge, the judge may, after he has convicted the said accused under section 229 or section 235, take evidence in respect of the alleged previous conviction and shall record a, a finding thereon. So in the case of previous conviction, there is a provision for enhanced penalty. So once the conviction is done, then before giving the penalty, the previous conviction is also 
then discussed provided that no such charge shall be read out by the judge nor shall the accused be asked to plead thereto nor shall the previous conviction be referred to by the prosecution or in ev any evidence adduced by it unless and until the accused has been convicted under section 229 or section 235 so when no reference of the previous conviction has to be made until the conviction has been done under section 229 or 235 because the previous conviction is only dealing with the quantum of the sentence so the person has already been convicted the court has agreed that this person has actually done the offense and so he and then the question arises what is the quantum of punishment to be given to this person so only at this stage will the previous conviction come into being so it is not that if a person has already then three thefts then it, he should be charged with the fourth theft no the fourth theft has to be proven independently and only after the uh, the person has been convicted for the fourth theft then this talk about his previous convictions will come into being when it comes to the quantum of sentence because we have seen before that every uh, every offense tells with it that it carries a sentence of imprisonment for up to this time so if if it says up to 2 years then the judge has the option of giving from 0 years to 2 years now whether the judge should give 0 years or 2 years that also has to be deliberated upon in the court and at this stage once this conviction has been done then the previous conviction is referred to by the prosecution or in any evidence adduced by it to say that we demand a higher punishment for this offender so this is how a case proceeds in a court so the charges have to be framed they have to be specific if something goes wrong then things can be corrected charges may be added charges may be altered if anything is changed then people are again given a right to defend themselves following the principles of natural justice but these processes have been made in this sequence so that the time is reduced as far as possible so for example in these cases first of all the prosecutor is going to present his evidence and after the prosecutor has presented his evidence the judge may decide whether to acquit the uh, uh, acquit this uh, uh, accused or not because if the evidence is not sufficient if it is not making for the case then it is not necessary to hear the defense so right at that stage the person may be acquitted then the defense is heard and then once both the parties have presented their case then comes the time of the argument after the argument there is the conviction only after the conviction is there any talk about the previous conviction because there is no need to waste time on previous conviction if in this particular case the offender cannot be charged if he cannot be convicted so why waste time about the previous convictions so these processes have been made in this sequential manner so that the principles of natural justice are followed but at the same time the trials are as speedy as possible so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind Thank you.